Sure. All right, without further ado, I wanna thank, first of all, the diversity group for coming in and sticking with us for that uh, extremely tense one minute, very <laughs> dramatic one minute. <laughs> But, uh, you know, we started this uh, part of Brain Turns in the original summer program, and it was extremely well received. And I think it, you know, it, it follows our previous talk with Dr. Smith, uh, you know, adequately and appropriately. Um, you know, what we found from the first group was that we had this, you know, underrepresented population, including 80% women, 40% Asian women, a, a large majority or large minority, really, of Latin Americans and African Americans and Blacks. And um, we, we think that you know, medicine happens to be one of the most diverse environments that exists. And uh, we appreciate you guys coming on board. Uh, Mr. Wright, Dr. Stern, Dr. Anish, I believe are all here. If you guys want to take a second, introduce yourselves and we'll jump right in. Appreciate your time. Uh, awesome. Uh, thanks, Randy. Uh, Dr. Langer, great to see you. Uh, Dr. Smith, I don't know how we follow uh, uh, the last discussion and, uh, and, and procedure. I mean, I, I learned a lot, so it was uh, terrific. Uh, you know, we're, we're delighted to be back, uh, and thank you again for the invitation. I'm just going to pull up a quick uh, a slide deck here, and then I'm going to hand it over to uh, uh, Dr. Stern and uh, Anu, who will also do uh, introductions. Um, so hopefully you can see that. Uh, let me put it in full screen. Here we are. So uh, my name is Michael Wright. I'm exactly from Norwell. And uh, as I say, we're just uh, honored, uh, delighted to spend this time with you. I know we only have a short time frame. Uh, what we want to do is, uh, you know, last go round, we spent. Uh, a fair bit of time talking about unconscious bias and how that impacts healthcare decisions uh, and uh, and patient outcomes. Uh, we touched on this topic of uh, microaggressions, but we got a lot of terrific feedback from you all. And so, uh, you know, we're coming back, Dr. Stern, um, going to deep dive on this uh, uh, this whole discussion of DINs and. Uh, uh, more now than ever. Uh, this is such an important area of focus um, within healthcare, within organizations, uh, as we uh, continue to, to focus on uh, addressing racial inequities and uh, seeing uh, this connected to uh, a public health crisis. Um, so we're, we're delighted to kind of deep dive on this. Uh, we're going to come back up and talk about allyship. We see allyship as really important in our ability to uh, uh, continue to address solutions that are going to drive change, uh, uh, change uh, as it relates to the amplification of healthcare disparities, uh, addressing racial inequity, structural racism. Um, and so allyship is really important uh, in this next step on our journey. And uh, hopefully you all, uh, I know you're not a shy group, but we'll look to have you all uh, weigh in on, uh, on chat and we'll uh, highlight comments as we go along. Uh, but for those of you who aren't familiar with Northwell, and I know that uh, that you all are, uh, but the largest health system in New York State, uh, uh, not for profit, largest not for profit employee, uh, 23 hospitals, well over 800 ambulatory sites, and uh, and um, uh, uh, well over actually 75,000 team members across our organization. Um, uh, who do terrific work each and every day. We've been on this journey of formalizing our approach to diversity, inclusion, and health equity for the last 10 years. In fact, this year we celebrated our 10th anniversary and um, uh, we were um, fortunate this, this past October to welcome back Dr. Richard Carmona, uh, who talked about uh, the importance of, uh, of uh, uh, increasing diversity uh, through community partnerships uh, and uh, um, you know, that being so critical now coming out of, you know, uh, navigating COVID and uh, addressing racial inequities. And so as we look into 2021, a uh, full filled year, uh, we're going to continue to double down on our focus on community partnerships and, and the work that we have to do uh, in addressing uh, and embedding and sustaining the tenets of diversity, inclusion and health equity and all that we do as a health system. And so, um, you know, we're part of the Center for Equity and Care. Uh, as I say, we've uh, uh, been uh, 
been uh, we formalized our approach uh, ten years ago, and uh, we've got a, a really robust uh, approach to uh, addressing uh, the tenets of diversity, inclusion, health equity, and all that we do, including, as Dr. Smith said, uh, within the the School of Medicine, our Graduate School of Nursing, across all of our entities, and uh, you know, big big part of our mission is. Uh, uh, is, is really to ensure that our team members are, um, uh, are have the skill, knowledge, and experience to provide culturally responsive healthcare uh, for our team members, patients, and the communities we serve. And so just a, a quick uh, introduction. Uh, I don't want to take away from the main focus of the presentation, but I want to uh, uh, welcome a colleague, a uh, dear friend of ours uh, at the center, Dr. Penny Stern. Uh, again, you will have met her uh, when we last uh, talked about unconscious bias. We're delighted to have her back, uh, spend some time with you all on this topic of microaggressions. And so without further ado, I'm going to stop sharing, Penny, and I'm going to hand it back over to you uh, to run through uh, your discussion. Thank you very much. I'm going to share my screen now. Um... Just give me one minute. Can everybody see this? You can just let me know whether you can. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Michael, for that introduction. As everybody's just heard, Northwell Health has made the subject of bias and unconscious bias and related topics such as microaggressions a system-wide priority. Um, and as he said, we've been doing this for a number of years. But in, in today's world, it's important for all of us to be well-versed in these important issues. Um, and I'm gonna be talking about microaggressions today, but this is just an introduction to a complex topic. And I hope it's gonna get everybody thinking about microaggressions and acting to limit their effects. So I'm going to start with a short video. If you can't see or hear this video, please speak up and let me know. You got a scholarship because you're a minority, right? Where are you from? I mean, where are you really from? You were born in Fort Wayne? You look like one of those terrorists. Did you grow up on a reservation? I bet you're a good dancer. You don't look gay. You have a girlfriend? Were you born that way? Mija, I actually don't do that. Ever. Hey, do you know any uh, good Mexican restaurants around here? You like fried chicken, right? So you were in the army. Did you ever kill anybody? Huh, looks like we got white privilege in the room. You have internet where you come from? Is it true you are terrible drivers? Oh my gosh, can I touch your hair? Is this okay? Are you a man or a woman? How do you learn to speak English so well? Maybe because I was born and raised in Iowa? You're so articulate. Do you know any terrorists? Why are you and your friends so loud? Do you have PTSD? Why do you wear that, uh, thing on your head? You have a scholarship for basketball, right? Are you from Ecuador? Is that like a third world country? You can't feel anything below your waist? So how do you... Why do you wear that? <laughs> really? You're studying engineering? I bet. You are good at math. So like, what's your deal? I mean, ethnically speaking. What's up? What's up? What's up? Just because I'm black? I don't actually say what's up. So I'd like to know what people think about this video, you know, what emotions come to mind and if you've ever experienced anything like what was depicted in this film. Um, I realize that we have too many people on board to have a discussion, but if you want to, please feel free to share your comments in the, in the chat box. Um, and so then we can share them um, with, with everybody. Uh, I'm going to use this as the jumping off point for this presentation. I'm going to start with, oops, sorry, there it is, the learning objectives for today. 
raise awareness about microaggressions and its common manifestations, recognize the consequences of microaggressions and review techniques to interrupt microaggressions. These are the learning objectives for today. So microaggressions are subtle, often unrecognized and commonplace verbal or behavioral, that is nonverbal indignities, whether intentional or unintentional, which communicate hostile, derogatory or negative slights and insults to a group. They are statements, actions, or incidents that are regarded as indirect, subtle, or even unintentional discrimination against members of a marginalized group. But the word is actually not a new one. It was coined by a psychiatrist and a Harvard University professor named Chester M. Pierce. Back in 1970, Dr. Pierce was the first to describe insults and dismissals, which he regularly witnessed being inflicted on African Americans as microaggressions. If you've never heard of Dr. Pierce, I'd like to tell you a little bit about his life, which gave him insights into many elements relating to bias, unconscious bias, and microaggressions. Um, Dr. Pierce was born on Glen Cove, Long Island, and he faced significant challenges as the first African-American president of his high school. He attended Harvard as an undergrad and later Harvard Medical School. He was the first African-American college football athlete to perform on a predominantly white university team versus an all white team below the Mason-Dixon line. Um, this is when Harvard's opponent was the University of Virginia in 1947. He held the rank of commander in the US Navy, and he was a senior consultant to the Surgeon General of the US Air Force. He was also a consultant to the US Arctic Research Commission. He spent a lot of time in Antarctica. He was a, a consultant to the Peace Corps and to NASA. He was a professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School and professor of education at Harvard University. He became the first African-American full professor at the Massachusetts General Hospital. He also served on the faculty of the Harvard School of Public Health. He was a senior psychiatrist at Massachusetts General where he spent much of his career and he was also a psychiatrist at the uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology for almost 25 years. He went on to become the president of the American Board of Psychiatry and Neurology, he was president of the American Orthopsychiatric Association and he was elected to the Institute of Medicine at the National Academy of Sciences. And he also had an, an annual research seminar named after him by the National Medical Association, published more than 180 books, articles, reviews, primarily on extreme environments. Told you he spent a lot of time at the South Pole, racism, media, sports medicine. He lectured on every continent and spoke at more than 100 US colleges and universities. He was even instrumental in advising the creators of Sesame Street, you know, the iconic children's television program on how to achieve racial balancing on the program. He passed away in, in 2016 at the age of 89 and he left an indelible international imprint on the world of medicine and in the fight against health disparities, discrimination, and of course, microaggressions. But the subject did not end with Dr. Pierce. Cross-cultural studies expert, Professor Daryl Wing Sue, who was a Portland, Oregon native. Uh, he was born there to Chinese immigrant parents. He had deep memories of being teased about his ethnicity in childhood. Uh, one of the few uh, Chinese descent people who lived in Portland in those days. And those experiments uh, led him to study human behavior. He uh, is, is a prolific author. These are some of his published works, and he's a professor at Columbia University's Teachers College now. But in the 1990s, Professor Sue enlarged on Dr. Pierce's work, and he defined microaggressions as brief, everyday exchanges that send denigrating messages to certain individuals because of their group membership. And he explained that these messages may actually not seem to be intentionally hurtful, as the person making the comment may be unaware of the impact of their words, often, but not always. Um, he divided microaggressions into subtypes, micro insults, micro assaults, 
micro invalidations. And I'm going to go into detail about these in a, in a moment. And he has said that the subtle forms of microaggressions are hard to prove. They're hard to quantify in some ways and very difficult for us to take action against because people often don't perceive it as harmful or significant. And he's pointed out that in many ways, racism has become more covert, more disguised than it used to be, which can make it more difficult to confront sometimes. Um, some of you may remember from our unconscious bias presentation several months ago that we often assume that everyone is seeing the world in the same way that we do and that we share the same views and the same perspectives. This is not the case as we are all the products of our unique backgrounds, our unique experiences, our unique cultures, and our unique perspectives. And these are the results of our, our social conditioning and the social messaging we all receive. So Professor Sue has explained that microaggressions really are reflections of the worldviews everyone holds on inclusion, exclusion, superiority, inferiority, and that microaggressions come out in ways that are often outside the level of an individual's conscious awareness. So my intent today is to bring this to conscious awareness as we do with unconscious bias. Um, and those of you who were present at the last lecture know what I'm talking about. So microaggressions are characterized in three ways. There are the three C's, constant, continual, and cumulative. According to Professor Sue, microaggressions occur to people of color from the moment of birth to when they die. That's constant. The people who don't see the lived experience of people of color, for example, tend not to believe that it's a major event. Um, each individual instance taken on its own is not usually extremely harmful, uh, hurt, harmful and I say usually, because it can be harmful, but it's usually not extremely harmful, but it's the compilation of instance after instance that really adds up. A microaggression is like a death from a thousand paper cuts. It's the cumulative effect of seemingly minor cuts that are so collectively painful. Um, think about the effects of microaggressions as mosquito bites. And one mosquito bite may not seem like much, although as has been pointed out to me on numerous occasions to someone who is intensely sensitive to mosquito bites, that's not really the case. One bite can be significant, but compare that one bite to this photo of hundreds of bites. Quite a difference and think of microaggressions in that way. So I have another video for you. which I hope is going to work. For people who still don't think that microaggressions are a problem. Oh, you're so well-spoken. Oh. Just imagine, instead of being a stupid comment, a microaggression is a mosquito bite. Ugh, it's a compliment. <laughs> mosquito bites and their itch are one of nature's most annoying features. But if you're only bitten every once in a while. No, where are you really from? Uh, Cleveland? Sure, it's annoying, but it's not that big a deal. The problem is that some people get bitten by mosquitoes a lot more than other people. I mean, a lot more. Whether it's on a date. Oh, your English is so good. Excuse me? Going grocery shopping. You know, everything happens for a reason. I'm just buying apples. Commuting to work. So when are you going to have a baby? Watching TV. We have to keep the Redskins name. It's part of our culture and history. Or just walking down the street with your partner. I couldn't even tell you were gay. <sighs> Mosquitoes seem to pop up everywhere. Do you know John? Give me shopping it's advice. So bad I love Cher too. And getting bit by mosquitoes every <laughs> damn day. Can I touch your hair? Multiple times a day. So pretty. Can, can I, I touch your it? Hair? Please. Can I please? Can I please? Is annoying. That makes you want to go ballistic on those mosquitoes, which seems like a huge overreaction to people who only get bit every once in a while. It's just a mosquito bite. Who cares? Just another angry black woman. Of course, beyond just being annoying, some mosquitoes carry truly threatening diseases that can mess up your life for years. Astrophysics? Hmm, maybe you should try this challenging major. Ow, my dreams. And other mosquitoes carry strains that can even kill you. It looked like he was up to trouble, okay? I felt threatened. So next time you think someone's overreacting, just remember, some people experience mosquito bites all the time. You're all so exotic, wow. And by mosquito bites, we mean microaggressions. Oh. 
So I'd like you to think about what you take away from uh, this video. And if you want to share, please feel free to share on the chat. I'm gonna go into the specifics of the difference between the three subtypes as um, described by, by Professor Sue. And I'm gonna start with micro assaults. Um, as I said, microaggressions have been divided into several subtypes and micro assaults is one of them. Micro assaults are a form of microaggression that involves um, purposeful discriminatory action, such as a verbal attack or carrying out a specific action, such as uh, painting a swastika or hanging a noose. Hate crimes in general are a form of micro assaults. Micro assaults imply violence and quite deliberately so. Um, these are more overt than other forms of microaggressions. And many of you may have experienced a micro assault in your time. Micro invalidations are another subtype of microaggressions. Micro invalidations are inflicted on millions of people because of their perceived ethnicity or color or disability by um, negating their experiences through everyday language. And there are actually four main types of micro invalidations. A common form implies that someone is actually an alien in their own country. That's when questions like, where are you really from? Or how come you speak English so well? Or can you teach me a few words in your native language? These appear. These kinds of comments make people feel that they are perpetual foreigners, never a true American, even if they've always lived in the US or even if they are part of families that have been in the US for generations. So micro invalidation may be based on the belief that people who have historically been marginalized cannot be experiencing racism now because the world is supposedly colorblind, that we don't see color, that there's only the human race and so forth. This kind of colorblindness claim serves to negate the racism that people of color experience, for example. It seems to say that a person's experience based on race are not relevant. Another form of micro invalidation is the type where people suggest that they can't be guilty of racism just because they have friends who struggled and thus understand the struggle by association. They may say things like, I can't be racist, my best friend is black. What they are essentially doing here is rejecting that racism or, or any other ism exists. Uh, Professor Sue has said that most prevalent micro invalidations are around the myth of meritocracy. And these operate in school and in the workplace. You know, you can succeed in America as long as you work hard. That's the kind of statement that suggests that marginalized people are themselves responsible for being held back, which completely ignores the reality that not everyone has the same opportunities and privileges. And then we come to micro insults, the third subtype of microaggressions. So what are you? Your name is so hard to pronounce. Can I call you Mary? You don't act like a normal black person. Where are you from? No, really, where are you from? Some of these may remind you of the video that we watched, but the common denominator is that all of these comments fall into the subcategory of micro insults. What are micro insults? The most common form of microaggression are micro insults. Um, Micro insults can be defined as verbal and nonverbal communications that subtly convey rudeness and insensitivity, and they demean a person's racial heritage or identity. An example is that employee who asks a colleague of color how she got her job, implying that she may have landed it through a quota system or affirmative action. Um, micro insults are the most common form of microaggression. Uh, example of micro insults that have occurred in the real world. Uh, Joe Biden complimented then Senator Barack Obama in 2007 regarding his fitness to run for the presidency by calling him the first mainstream African American who was articulate and bright and clean and a nice looking guy. And that was his quote. Um, television personality Katie Couric asked um, Laverne Cox, who is a, a transgender actress and uh, Carmen Carrera, who's a transgender model, about their genitals on national television. Or um, when a straight person calls something gay to mean stupid, 
or when a man calls a woman sweetie or baby in a professional environment. And you can go on and on in this way with micro insults. So why do we care so much about these things? Well, David Clark, who's a clinical psychologist and a researcher at the University of New Brunswick in Canada, defines intrusive cognition as any distinct, identifiable cognitive event that is unwarranted, unintended, and recurrent. It interrupts the flow of thought, interferes in task performance, is associated with negative affect, and is difficult to control. So this is often the result of microaggressions. Intrusive thoughts can be difficult to turn off. They can be persistent. They can provoke anxiety. And they occur in people experiencing microaggressions. It leads them to wonder incessantly, can I possibly have heard what I think I heard? Did I really hear that? Uh, what do they mean by that? What do I think they mean by that? What do they mean by that? Should I say something? Um, maybe I'm overreacting. What if they think I'm overreacting? If I speak up, am I going to be in a worse position? Uh, why should I speak up? Um, should I speak up? This kind of intrusive thoughts that don't go away. And there are psychological consequences to microaggressions. They can be severe. They can be persistent. And they can be very, very real. It's been found that racial and ethnic minorities are more likely to experience both immediate distress and long-term effects from microaggressions, including depression, low self-esteem, increased anxiety, and problems with sleep. And of particular concern is the loss of drive and the reduced learning, thinking, and reasoning skills that can result from microaggressions. There are other consequences. Uh, Kathy O'Beer, who's at the Center for Transformation and Change, has looked at other consequences of, of microaggressions. Um, and she categorizes them as including uncertainty, uh, that feeling of never knowing when they're going to experience another microaggression, or hypervigilance, being constantly vigilant, always mindful of everything that's around because you don't know where the next you know, indignity is going to come from. Self-doubt. Um, given the ambiguous nature of some situations, some people may obsess over questions like, am I being too sensitive? Am I misinterpreting what's, what's just happened? Am I being paranoid? Am I overreacting? Um, many people try to change their behavior in the hopes that this may lessen their experience of microaggressions. And they may come across as overly friendly, uh, overly helpful, passive, um, too soft-spoken, too ingratiating, feeling pressure to act right, or their actions could be used to reinforce stereotypes about their marginalized group. Um, they feel that they're carrying the group on their shoulders. So microaggressions can arise from many sources and they can become internalized so that the person who is the target may begin to accept what is directed to them and believe it. And this is related to the concept of stereotype threat, which is a term that refers to being at risk for confirming as a, as a self-characteristic, a negative stereotype about your own social group. And if you haven't come across stereotype threat before, um, I mentioned this a few months ago when we last spoke, but you may want to read Dr. Camara Jones at C-A-M-A-R-A -A Jones's classic article about levels of racism. She includes in this the allegory of the gardener. Um, and this paper, I, I believe that Anu is going to actually post it in the chat so you can look it up if you haven't seen it yet. It looks at many elements of, of racism, including stereotype threat. And uh, it's only a few pages long and, and well worth your attention. Um, it came from the American Journal of Public Health about 20 years ago, but still very pertinent. So in dealing with microaggressions, the question arises to interrupt or not to interrupt. First, an individual must feel able to interrupt when a microaggression takes place. It's not always easy to stand up in the face of circumstances like this. And to do it successfully, you have to know how to do it and be aware of some of the tools to use. So Rachel Murray writing in the Muse explains some options if you're on the receiving end 
of a microaggression. So the first thing is taking a breath and figuring out how you want to respond. It's really easy to get angry and lash out, especially if this is your 1,000th paper cut. Then you can decide if you want to talk with the person about what happened. It may be appropriate to do it at the moment, but it's important to recognize that power dynamics can be at play here. So if you decide to confront someone, you wanna be sure you feel safe enough to do so. If you decide to talk with the person, be clear that it's not about calling someone a racist, a sexist, or any other ist. It's about the act and the words. Because once you call someone a racist or a sexist, the conversation stops. But if you focus on the action, it's something that can be addressed. And uh, tell them, relay to them, that this isn't about shaming or blaming, but that You've come to them because you want to express that you were hurt and perhaps that you value the relationship enough to have the conversation. Um, ask how the person is feeling after you've shared the impact of their actions and wait and listen. Understand that you might not get the reaction you want. If the person is defensive and wants to turn it around and make it about having a laugh, you can try to have a deeper conversation, but again, it's about your comfort level. And then you can accept the outcome and move on. So how do you offer support to somebody who just experienced a microaggression? Well, the first thing, of course, is to remain calm. As I said, it's easy to get emotional in this situation, but don't immediately assume the worst. That is, if you speak up, it's going to cause the situation to blow up and cause more damage. So what can you do? Well, you take a breath as I said before, and decide if you want to speak up about what happened. If you do decide to talk, acknowledge that you're sharing your feelings as the person who you think was offended may not have been offended at all. It's how you're feeling. And you may want to go through the same steps that I mentioned as if you were the recipient of a microaggression. But it's really important to remember this is your experience and it isn't about fixing anyone. So here are some strategies to consider. First of all, separate the person from the behavior. Always remember that using the word you can make the situation more inflamed. Be general, as in this example, instead of saying flatly, you're a racist, which is almost guaranteed to generate a negative defensive response, say that could be perceived as a racist remark and give them the opportunity to reflect on what they've said. As you've probably learned from any experience you've had with conflict resolution, using I statements brings it back to you and how you feel and how you were affected rather than pointing fingers when you use the word you. So for example, you know, when such and such happened, I felt like this rather than lashing out with you statements, which is almost guaranteed to turn somebody off. Ask questions about the behavior again to encourage reflection rather than saying why, because that can put people on defensive, say how, what made you rather than why. Always keep in mind your tone of voice and your body language. I think this photograph clearly indicates how this guy must feel while being spoken to by the woman in this picture. Um, you don't even have to hear anything to see how the body language says it all. So let's talk about interrupting microaggressions with action. This is an acronym that we've developed. A, ask clarifying questions that will help the other person clarify what was meant by their comments. C, come from a place of curious inquiry and not judgment, being judgmental almost never works. Tell what you've heard or experienced. Explain what your experience has been and what you heard. Explore the impact of the statements that were made and discuss them. Know your own thoughts and feelings. They're yours and they're important. 
next steps. What are next steps? Well, engage in self-reflection to identify times that you may have been microaggressive in your personal and work life. Participate in continuing education activities. Avoid making assumptions and labeling people. As far as institutions are concerned, it's very helpful to be in an institution like ours that fosters inclusive and supportive environments. And we collaborate with groups and organizations that are committed to addressing issues of diversity and inclusion. And of course, offer trainings and opportunities for continuing education. And we do that a great deal at Northwell. So how do we create a culture of empathy which develops trust and supports empathic communication between people? We start with exploration. Exploration is an approach to learning and communication that encourages us to examine and investigate new material in order to identify relationships between existing knowledge and new concepts. It's where we ask the questions to understand the impact of an experience on a person. Legitimation. That refers to the process by which we acknowledge the legitimacy of another person's feelings. Legitimacy is characterized by active listening, nonverbal affirmation, affirmation, validation, reassurance, reflection, reflecting a feeling or feelings back to a person so they feel validated and affirmed. And empathy. Empathy is the ability to understand and share the feelings of another. And you've got this. So here is my last video. I'd like to thank you for your attention and let you know that you're going to be receiving a, a two-page interrupting microaggressions tool that you that was collected from various sources that you may find helpful going forward. So I'm going to stop sharing and thank you, Dr. Stern. Uh, you've really um fostered a lot of dialogue on chat. There's well over uh, 1,700 folks on this chat. I think we got 1,700 comments uh, as we were going through. I think you provoked a lot of uh, thoughts, perspectives based on people's own experience of having to deal with microaggressions, uh, either as a, a receiver of a microaggression or even perpetu uh, perpetrating microaggressions unintentionally, right? Um, and so I think you've given folks uh, strategies uh, to think differently uh, in, in this space. And so uh, just a heartfelt thanks. And uh, to, to, uh, there's been a lot of comments in terms of, do I get the presentation videos, et cetera, but we'll make sure 
uh, you get access to the information. Uh, let's uh, continue the dialogue just in the time frame that we have. I want to hand it over to Anunish uh, from the Center for Equity of Care uh, to spend some time just uh, building off this discussion around microaggressions and focus now on allyship and seeing this as really important uh, in uh, the work uh, around embedding and sustaining the tenants of diversity, inclusion, health equity, and all that we do. Uh, for patients, uh, team members, and uh, communities. Uh, and you interject, I'm going to interject one thing, the importance of speaking up. You know, yeah. I, I um, was on a, one of my uh, women that I recruited is a neurosurgeon in Staten Island. She's running our Staten Island program. And we were having meetings. We probably had, you know, half a dozen meetings over the course of a few months. And after one of the meetings, she called me and says, Dave, I just want you to know that I feel like you're, you know, you're, I feel like you're belittling me or that you're, mm -hmm. you're, you're uh, mansplaining. I can't remember the, the word that she used, but I wasn't even aware of it. You right. Know? You know, part of it was, I felt like as a leader that I wanted to be valuable and I wanted mm -hmm. to be, uh, try to, to help her to learn, know what I know, but it didn't come across that way to her. Right. And she called me on it and she says, you know, just, you know, sometimes don't, speak over me don't you know let me let me talk i don't i don't need you to explain and I, it was just an, I don't, it was just being aware and i can't mm -hmm. emphasize the enough i i saw a lot of the comments mm -hmm. you know it's it's you have to speak up you know we all most of us uh i'm i'm a i'm a i'm jewish so i'm a different kind of minority but you know as a white male you're you there are certain you know assumptions that are made about us and certain assumptions that we make mm -hmm. about everyone else and some are, some of us are better than others but it, it's so important that we get that kind of feedback in a in a not confrontational way but in a respectful way and we it, it, it made our relationship better and now I understand I'm much more sensitive to it I hear myself if we, if we are if it's not pointed out to us and you just go home and you complain to your friends or your family or your significant other it's not going to nearly have the impact so don't be afraid to say something because yeah. if the person's worth it, they'll get better. And if they're not, then that's their problem. And at least you've brought it to their attention. Just yeah, want no. to make sure I've, I've been through it myself, so. No, well said, and thanks for sharing that. And, uh, you know, we're kind of all on this learning journey, right? And so our willingness to be open to give and receive feedback uh, only helps us uh, um, be more authentic and, uh, uh, you, you know, just, just, treat each other with dignity and respect, right? And so, uh, and to your point, you know, sometimes we may not be aware of uh, our blind spots. And so we rely on others to kind of hold the mirror up and give us that uh, that insight and perspective. And we've got to create a space for that to occur. And it sounds like you did that, which is what, what allowed for the feedback. So that's terrific. One of the things is a lot of the kids are saying they're terrified of speaking out to male colleagues that mm -hmm. worried about their career. Look, in order to be successful, you got to have mentors. Yeah. And you have people that you trust. And if you were working for somebody that's not going to listen to you, that yeah. person was going to help you anyway. So you're going to have to find that. It may be harder as a woman or as a minority, for sure. We're here. We're trying to establish this now as person in Linux neurosurgery mm -hmm. and set a standard for the way this is done. That's why we have these courses. But you can't, if, if, if somebody's not willing to listen, then find another person to work for because it's right. just going to block you in other ways someday. Yeah. And that's, I think, very, very important. Uh, so important just in general, but even uh, in leadership, it's, it's if, if we're not open, we're not listening, it can serve as a derailleur. Encourage you, uh, so I'm a professor of business at uh, Hofstra, encourage you to take a look at Simon Sinek's uh, video, Be the Last to Speak. Uh, just on a side note, uh, sometimes as leaders and people in general, we want to throw in solutions and try to solve for it. But if we take the time just to kind of step back and hear everybody uh, speak first, uh, we get insights, perspectives that we might not have got. In doing so, we're building trust and uh, credibility with the teams that we learn. So Simon Sinek, be the last to speak. Uh, thanks, Dr. Langer. Uh, Neil, I'm going to hand it over to you. Thank you so much, Michael. Dr. Langer, as I was hearing you speak, I couldn't help but think about how you hit so many of the main points that we're going to be talking about um, in this allyship lecture today. Um, thank you so much to everyone and Dr. Stern, phenomenal um, presentation. And it really leads us to this topic of what do we do when we recognize our colleagues or those around us, friends, family, are um, dealing with these microaggressions, are victims of microaggressions, and what does it take to really build um, a key 
key relationship and to be an ally. So to start off today, um, I'm going to show you a quick video. I mean, as I was listening to Dr. Stern's um, presentation, in addition to what Dr. Langover is saying, you know, I was thinking of the quote, knowledge is power. Um, but dare I say, knowledge is also responsibility. Um, we heard about microaggressions, the role that it plays on someone's mental health, um, emotional health. And with that awareness, what do we do with that? What is the responsibility that we now have? Um, and that's where we're going to walk into in the next couple of slides. So as we're watching this video, I want you to think about uh, the different individuals. Um, what does it take to be an ally? Are there different people in here that you identify with? Um, and what are you hearing as part of their stories? Hello. What's going now? Oi. Hi. Marhaba, Ana No. Konnichiwa. Vamos a hablar. This is about you. This is about us. I'm a father of four amazing kids. A dancer, but only in my bedroom. <laughs> a believer in the power of stories. Soy bilingüe, casi trilingüe. An engineer, a nerd. Soy lesbica, yo soy amiga. Japanese, Korean. Palestinian, a German national. An immigrant, East Asian American woman of color. And a Zemiltek. Anatomo, watashi no doryo desu. We bake amazing things together. We aspire to bring joy to the entire world. But you and I inhabit different worlds. You and I have access to different spaces. Unless you've experienced it, you can never fully understand what it's like to be stuck between two cultures. To pretend to be someone else in order to be safe. To grow up in South America and Spanish, and at 19 having to relocate to the U.S. and live in English. To be a black gay man from the rural South. And be the only one in the room. Unless you've experienced it yourself, you can never really know what it's like. To have to listen to someone be degrading to your race and be the only person of that race in the room. To lose friends, family, co-workers, simply because you wanted to be who you are. To not know whether you can call the country that you love home. To be the father of a trans daughter. I think we all have a responsibility to make the world that we live in a little bit better. And you kind of have to start where you are. What allyship is, is listening, compassion. To immerse yourself in content and experiences and stories from groups that aren't of your own. Anybody who sees something that isn't quite right can become an ally and help their colleagues. When you've been through a struggle that hurt you for such a long time, I think you have this endless energy to give to others. Anyone can be an ally and everyone can use an ally and you can use your privilege in the moment to extend that privilege to someone else. I think this is what makes us human to help others and to be empathetic. We are all learning. We're all learning. Está todo mundo aprendendo. My bad. Together. Juntos. Is one company. We can all be allies. We can all be allies. There are a number um, of us on the chat today, but I would love to pose this question to you. Um, what does it look like to be an ally? You know, um, we saw a lot of different comments in here about ally being this who immerse themselves in other stories and, and, and truly being an active listener, someone who's empathetic. Um, as we're watching this video, something that also stood out to me was just the I am statements. I mean, you know, I am a father of four. I am an immigrant. And there's power in that, right? And that's what Dr. Langer was saying, speaking up, the, the same things that, uh, that cause kind of pain and confusion and hurt for these individuals is such a huge part of their identity. You know, so I challenge you to also share into the chat, what is your I am? Right, so if I'm asked that I'm an immigrant, right, um, I actually immigrated from India when I was four years old. The first language that I spoke was not English. I actually learned that around the time that I was five or six. But that is a part of who I am. Every time my accent may come up or there's certain things that I don't understand that um, are said in certain languages where I'm like, huh, I'm, I'm not used to that or certain experiences that I may not have in relation to my colleagues it's still a part of my story, right? It is my identity. 
identify. And the more that I speak up about it, the more I'm able to teach other people um, and really say, you know, this is a part of my story. You know, and this leads us to the question of exactly what is an ally? You know, an ally is any person who actively promotes and inspires to advance a culture of inclusion. And how exactly can you do that? You know, you do that by lifting others up, by advocating for them and really sharing opportunities for growth. So what does that look like? Telling them about a book that might possibly give them an opportunity to learn a bit more, um, an internship opportunity, a job. Are there things that we can do to champion others and really call out the greatness in them? Um, there's a mention of just mentorship. And I remember early on in my career, I was struggling a lot because I was the only Asian American in my job. Um, and I remember at that role after I left, there was someone who really stood out to me and I ended up reaching out to her and I asked her to be my mentor. And I said, these are my struggles. These are the things that I'm dealing with. And that gave me an opportunity to share and also learn and learn how to advocate for myself. Because when I learn how to advocate for myself, I'm also learning how to advocate for others. But it also required me, one, to share openly what I'm looking for and for that individual to actively listen as well. We want to recognize systemic um, inequalities and recognize the impact of microaggressions. As Dr. Stern shared in her presentation earlier, sometimes one microaggression feels like an individual mosquito bite, but when that's repeated day to day over time, it becomes very painful, right? And we want to be aware of that and how it can impact, um, especially marginalized groups. We also want to most importantly um, be an ally that listens, supports, self-reflects, and changes. You know, in a fast-paced environment, sometimes there isn't enough of that. We want to listen to understand, not just listen to respond, right? We want to be able to really reflect on stories and things that we may not fully know and recognize that sometimes our shared experiences are not going to look like everyone else's, and that's perfectly fine. So what exactly is an allyship and how do you build that? So it's a lifelong process. It's not a destination, right? It's truly a journey. And it's something that's built on trust, consistency, and accountability. And I really want to focus in on those three main components. They're not tangible attributes. However, there's something that a person can truly feel. And this can be said for both personal and professional relationships. Because once you have a person's trust, it's important to have consistency in responses, consistency in the way that we really engage in those relationships and being accountable. When we make a mistake, owning up to that and say, you know what, I didn't know that. But now that you've brought that to my awareness, I'm going to be consistent. And, and, and recognizing that within myself, right? So having a capacity to really use a flashlight on ourselves, right? What are areas that we can really look into and say, you know what? I could definitely engage in a little bit more self-reflection there. First and foremost, how do you foster that um, allyship? How do you foster that kind of environment and build a culture of inclusion? You want to make space and not take it up. Right? So you really want to honor the stories and the experiences of those around you. And honor is not a word that we hear quite often, but it's defined by respect. It's defined by holding someone in high esteem. And when we were looking at that Netflix video, you saw the titles of the individuals below there, whether they were an engineer or they created content or they were an operations director. But outside of that, everything that they were sharing was truly them as a whole person. Right, so in your careers, as you become PAs, physicians, nurses, wherever life takes you, you know, you are, you are that role, but you're also a person with very real lived experiences, right? So there's the doctor who's a father, who's a dog lover and loves marathons, but also saves lives, right? And that's a whole part of their story. And there's a lot of hurts and things that they've also faced. And those are the things that we wanna honor and recognize that makes the person who they are. And as Michael um, mentioned before, recognizing our blind spots. And if we don't take that time to reflect, we won't recognize they're there. And that's really a matter of checking our truths and our assumptions, things that we have inherently come to believe. And that really takes a level of vulnerability and humility. Right? And a lot of times admitting that you don't know the answer is not something that's favorable. It's uncomfortable, but we need to get comfortable being uncomfortable. That's a huge part of leadership. Those are the kind of leaders that people want to follow and look up to, right? Because you're not just someone that's there giving direction, but you're also someone who's role modeling this behavior, 
right? And this is something that really allows to continuously build that culture because we don't want our blind spots to be a roadblock to us ultimately building meaningful relationships with those around us. And lastly, you wanna stand up and show up. Right, and the truth is there may be situations where we don't know the answer to everything that someone's facing. Um, the goal is not to be able to relate to every experience. The goal is really to listen and to understand, be an active listener, and that takes a lot of courage. You know, and it can be difficult at times, but you know, what we're challenging you to do today is to really practice that level of vulnerability, right? We wanna create a safe space for conversation. I see even in the chat, a lot of you sharing your lived experience and that can't be easy, but we're taking these safe spaces and creating brave spaces for people to really share their um, moments and say, you know, this is who I am. And as you learn that about each other and all these experiences, you are able to really become an ally for those around you, right? understanding that certain racial and ethnic groups that have been marginalized there is a historical context behind that and knowing that they will need certain support so how can you speak up in those moments when you recognize that you have an opportunity to do so so that uh, ends off our diversity lecture for today just that importance of allyship and being an ally so i'm going to hand it back to uh, michael wright to close off for us Awesome, thank you Anu. Um, you've left us a lot to think about and we're coming up to the top of the hour here, Randy and David and uh, Josh. And so, you know, I just wanna say a heartfelt thanks for the opportunity to join. You can't cover it all, uh, but uh, you know, hopefully we've given uh, everyone here just some food for thought, you know, kind of emphasizes some of the experiences uh, that we've had and, and ultimately getting us to strategies where we can continue to uh, improve ourselves as leaders, but also so the work that we do uh, with others and, uh, and you know, again, down path, we're on this lifelong journey of treating everyone with dignity and respect. And as Anu said, this is not a destination. It's about building accountability and advocacy to create the change, uh, the sustainable change uh, that we're looking for. Uh, and that requires vulnerability, authenticity, uh, and just being true to ourselves, right? Um, and so, uh, heartfelt thanks. Uh, at Northwell, we just launched an inclusion academy uh, back in October. Uh, we're building out a whole suite of offerings. Uh, so happy to come back. I, one of the things that we're focused on right now is this notion, uh, this area of inclusive leadership. And so um, just put that out there for uh, future offerings. And uh, there's a few other things that are gonna be coming out through Inclusion Academy. So thank you all for the opportunity to be part of uh, uh, this day with you. Hey, Mike, are you on a laptop? Uh, yeah, I'm on a laptop. Maybe you could show us the west side, the, the, oh. the river to all our non-New Yorkers. <laughs> You're just sure. in the apartment view. That's well, awesome. This is, this is uh, Hudson uh, River on the west side. Hudson Yards in Times Square. <laughs> so, that's, right where the, that's right where Sully's plane went down. Another yes, right, yes, right there. <laughs> so, anyways, uh, thanks for the opportunity uh, to be with you all today, and uh, wish you continued rest of uh, an enjoyable rest of the day. Yeah, Michael, thank you so much for again for being a part of this. I think this lecture um, will be included as as much as as often as you guys are willing to give it in brain turns. I think it's absolutely critical. Uh, I think it goes hand in hand with what we kind of believe in when we started this mm. um, about making sure everyone's included uh, and the future of medicine relies on, you know, the thinking of, of different people from different backgrounds and incorporating that. So everyone, it's uh, it's lunchtime. Uh, come back at one o'clock. You will not want to miss the lecture with Dr. Carrico uh, discussing the really the research that proved to be the, the backbone of the COVID vaccine. Um, it's sure to kind of change the world. So, you know, an incredible story as well um, and ties in really nicely to all the stuff we've talked about, including things like diversity and inclusion and um, a truly terrific story. So thank you guys. Uh, I just want to add one thing about that. Thank you so much, Michael and Anu and Penny. Yeah, thank but you. The, the, the next, the lecture with Kate is something you can't miss. I, I know it's uh, late and you spent already three hours on a computer, but um, this she's going to win the Nobel Prize this year. Mm -hmm. um, if you look her up with your hour off, you'll see how much attention she's gotten all over the world. Her Twitter followers have gone from like 10 to about 12,000 the last week. I've known her since the late 80s, early 90s, and um, she's just an incredible human being and, and as, as a story that's just dropped dead incredible. 
and her science led to the COVID vaccines. So she has real insight into what's going on at BioNTech and what's happening in Moderna, the science, the, the, the challenges that she encountered uh, just personally and professionally. And uh, it's my daughter, hold on, I'll be right there, Molly. And uh, so please join us at one. Thanks so much, guys. I'm back in an hour. See you guys soon.